This morning, we are going to finish up our look into the glory of God. Over the past month and a half, we've talked about several aspects of God's glory, about its all-consuming nature, the light of his glory, the weight of his glory, how to give him glory. And today we are going to wrap up by looking at one more important aspect of God's glory, particularly as it relates to the advent and second coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we move into this holiday season, the season of Advent, leading up to when we celebrate the birth of Christ, well, we often miss something at this time of year. So much of our Christmas festivities, celebrations, are centered upon remembering Christ's first advent into this world, his first coming into this world. However, this season within the life of the body of Christ offers us so much more than just reflecting upon something that happened over 2,000 years ago. The Christmas season is supposed to point us forward as much as it reminds us of what has already taken place. Our celebration of Christ's first arrival into this world is supposed to make us look ahead with expectancy and excitement to his forthcoming second arrival into this world. A second coming that will put God's glory on full display for all to see. One of the most informative texts that we have in scripture about Christ's second coming into this world comes from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. A passage that deals with Christ's ascension into heaven. That is, after Christ had resurrected from the dead, and after he had spent some time with his disciples, that time when he left this earth and went up into the heavens. And it might sound strange that a passage about Jesus leaving this world would teach us a lot about his second coming to this world, but it does. In fact, it, it stresses three important things that we need to focus on in order to understand what Christ's second coming will look like. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So if you'll turn in your Bibles, if you haven't done so already, to Acts chapter 1. We're going to be reading verse 6 down through verse 12. The verses will be up on the screen or you can read along in your Bibles. Beginning in verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, Two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. Now, before we get into the ascension of Christ, the first few verses here kind of give us some groundwork that we need to focus on, delay before we focus on that ascension. As the book of Acts begins, the disciples are gathered together with Jesus in Jerusalem, who had just been resurrected a few weeks before. And while with Jesus in verse 6, they ask him a revealing question. A question that revealed some continued misunderstanding, some continued confusion as to the agenda of Jesus Christ. Acts 1, 6 again. They ask, Lord, 
Will you at this time restore the kingdom of, to Israel? Many of the Lord's followers, including his inner circle of disciples that he had spent three years molding, shaping, training. Well, even these people struggled to understand Christ's agenda. All their lives, they had been taught to expect a Messiah. A Savior who would reestablish the nation of Israel, returning it to the kind of glory the Jews hadn't known since the days of David and Solomon. So the Jewish people, they had anticipated not only this religious Savior, but this, this political leader who would not only be a, a priest, but would also be a king. And the pages of Scripture do indicate that God does have future plans for Israel. And that God will fulfill all of his promises concerning the Israelite people. And it's also true that Jesus Christ was the perfect high priest and the king of kings. But he had not planned to build the kingdom of God in the time or manner that any one of his followers had expected. The people had expectations as to who the Messiah would be and what he would accomplish. But fortunately, and as often the case, man's ideas of what is best of how things should work are always trumped by what God actually does. God's plan through Jesus would exceed mankind's expectations. And so in response to the disciples' question, Jesus, as he so often does, he gently rebukes. He admonishes his disciples in verses 7 through 8. It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Pastor Jared translation. Relax. My father's plan is going to carry itself out in its own time. And there's nothing you can do to hasten it or to slow it down. And power and with authority to rule the whole world. But until that time, until that second coming of Christ, God had something in store for those who belong to him in this world. Instead of worrying about future dates and times, Instead of worrying about the future restoration of Israel, some future kingdom, God had something better for these individuals to focus on. He had work for them to do and resources to give them to accomplish that work. And instead of worrying about dates and times to come, Christ tells them there in verse 8 that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. The Greek term for power refers to one's ability or capacity to accomplish something. So Christ's disciples, upon receiving the Holy Spirit, they would be given this power to do something. To do whatever task the Lord had called them to do. And what had the Lord called them to do, according to verse 8? To be his witnesses. That is, they would testify about Jesus based upon what they had personally seen and experienced during their time with him. And Jesus tells them that they will be his witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. And from that point on, that's exactly what we see play out in the life of the early church in the book of Acts. God's plan in establishing his kingdom included his spirit living inside his people so that those people enabled by his power would both live out and proclaim the message of Jesus Christ to those throughout the world, thus building the kingdom of God. It's after Jesus gives them this instruction to be his witnesses, after he informs them of the power that will come upon them for them to accomplish it, that all of a sudden Jesus is taken up out of their sight. 
Here we get the details of his ascension into heaven in verses 9 through 11, which serves to instruct us on what to look out for when Christ comes again. So what are the three things that this, these verses teach us? Well, number one, the return of Christ will be personal. After watching Jesus go up into a cloud, we are told in verse 10 that two men dressed in white robes came and stood by Christ's disciples. These are widely regarded as angels of the Lord God. And they tell the disciples in verse 11 that this Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This Jesus will return, they tell them. That is, the very same person who the disciples saw the part that day will come back. This is significant because it tells us what to expect, what to be on the lookout for. When Jesus returns a second time, he's not coming back as a baby born in a manger. When Jesus appears again, he's not going to take a different form or different identity. He is not going to be reincarnated as a thing or another being. He won't return in the form of a ghost or spirit. For as we read in verse 8, he's already with us in the form of a spirit, the Holy Spirit. Knowing Christ returns, he's coming back in his own human body. And so you could say that Jesus Christ is coming back physically, literally, and unmistakably. Whereas many miss who the Messiah was during his first advent into this world as a baby, when Christ comes again, it will be clear for all to see that he is the Savior and Lord. Ever since Christ came into this world, there have been many people from that day, even up until today, who have claimed to be a Messiah figure. In fact, several have claimed to be the Messiah, the Lord. One of note to us here in America in recent history would be David Koresh in Waco, Texas, who died along with many of his followers back in 1993. But when Jesus Christ returns... It will be clear for all to see that he is indeed the great and mighty Savior and Lord. It will be clear based upon his appearance, but also based upon the manner in which he will return. And that leads to the second fact that this passage teaches us about his return. And that is that the return of Christ will be visible. Not only do the angels tell the Christ Followers looking on at his ascension into heaven that this Jesus will return, they also tell them that he will come in the same way that they saw him go into heaven. And how do they see him go up into heaven? Well, verse 9 tells us that he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of the disciples' sight. The disciples saw Jesus in the flesh, lifted up into a cloud, and then they witness the clouds carrying him off out of sight. So what the angels are telling us here is that Jesus is going to return in a similar manner. Jesus rode into the clouds and passed from this earthly dimension into the heavenly realm. And he will return in the same manner. One day he will come back as Savior and King. And when he returns, he will appear from the clouds and descend from above in his human body. Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back dramatically. His return will be a dramatic, must-see event. And as we look ahead to that second coming of Jesus Christ, one thing that we can do as believers is contrast that with his first advent into this world. He's coming back in a dramatic way. But think about how Jesus Christ came into a world as a baby. We look back on it. We celebrate it as a significant and special event. But at the time, it was something relegated 
to a cave in some rocks. Those who celebrated it were Jesus' parents, some lowly shepherds, and some animals. But Jesus' second and final arrival into this world will be something for all to see. It will be the event to witness for both believer and unbeliever. A scene so dramatic and awe-inspiring, sure to fill believers with excitement and unimaginable joy, and those apart from Christ with imposing and formidable dread. A scene so stupendous, so glorious to behold, befitting the glorious nature of our King. And that's the third point that this teaches us, and most important point. And that is that the return of Christ will be in glory. The glorious nature of Christ Return is evidenced by two particular points of note regarding his ascension into heaven. The first has to do with the location from which Jesus ascended. Jesus had led his followers to a spot on the Mount of Olives, as we are told in verse 12. And most likely they went to a side, a side of the mountain on the east side, over the ridge from Jerusalem. And if you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that the Mount of Olives has some important significance to the Jewish people. It has a deeply meaningful place in the Old Testament. Back in Ezekiel 11.23, we are told that the light of God's presence departed the forsaken temple in Jerusalem. And we are told that the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of that city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. Because of the sin of the people, God's glory departed Jerusalem, departed the temple, and went out to the mount called Olivet. And according to the prophet Zechariah, we are told that the Lord will one day in the future come to this mountain before taking Jerusalem. Only the all-powerful king of kings, he's not going to climb this mountain as we would do. He's not going to ascend up one side and descend down the other. We are told in Zechariah 14.4 that this mountain will be split like a curtain from east until west. Half of the mountain will move to the north, half of the mountain will move to the south. And the Lord of lords, the king of kings, will pass through on his way to Jerusalem. All of that, this was the place from which Jesus ascended into heaven. And as such, the significance of the location points to the glorious return of Jesus Christ. In the book of Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord God departed Jerusalem to this mountain. But in the book of Zechariah, we see that the Lord will one day return in his full glory from this mountain as well. Christ's glorious return will be a fulfillment of this prophecy as God's glory will descend upon Jerusalem once again, this time for eternity as part of the new heaven and new earth. We also know that Christ's return will be in glory based upon the manner in which he departed. Once again, Jesus was taken up in a cloud out of the disciples' sight. Well, this is significant because in the Old Testament, God's glorious presence often appeared in the form of a cloud. And based upon Acts 1.11, we know that Christ will be returning in the same way into heaven. And so thus, when Jesus Christ comes back at his second coming, he will be coming back in a cloud. And this is the Bible's way of telling us that he will be coming back in the glory of God. Christ's second advent to this world will be a magnificent and clear display of the glory of our God. We've talked before about how this concept of God's glory can be a difficult one for us to wrap our minds around, to grasp, to define. And that's why we spent some time in recent weeks talking about the glory of God. However, if you want to put an image in your mind, of what the glory of God is, if you want to explain God's glory in a picture, 
And the best one that we can come up with from Scripture is Jesus Christ in his full and radiant splendor upon his victorious return to this world. <clears throat> Jesus Christ at his return, that is the glory of God. And as beautiful a picture you can conjure up in your minds, I promise you, whatever you're thinking that day will be like, once again, God's plan will exceed our best expectations. What are we to take from all of this? At this time of season, this holiday season, this Christmas season, as we approach Christmas, as we go through this wonderful time of year, I encourage each and every single one of you to spend as much time, if not more, looking ahead to what is to come than back what has taken place in the past. As great and glorious as the birth of Christ was, what is to come will be far better to behold. Remember and celebrate what happened in the past, but look hopefully ahead to what is to come. Just as God came into this world in human flesh, he is coming again. But this time, not as a babe in a manger, he's coming back as a king to rule. This is a season of hope because of a baby that was born. And one day all of our hope will be fully realized when we see Jesus face to face. The thing is, we don't know when Christ is going to return again. But we do know that it can be at any moment. And so until then, we aren't to be like the disciples here in Acts chapter 1, standing around and watching as things are taking place around us. We aren't to get caught just standing, looking, as the disciples did as Jesus went to the heavens. We aren't to spend so much time pondering his return that we don't get busy doing what he has called us to do. We aren't to get caught dwelling too much on past events if it keeps us from doing what God has told us to do. We are to get busy being his witnesses to the ends of the earth. He's given us his power through his spirit to do just that. There's nothing that will bring more glory to our Father in heaven than for us to be witnesses to his son this Christmas season. The one thing I can promise is that the people around us that God has placed in our lives, they will not move from darkness to light. They will not move from death to life by our celebration of past events. Unless those celebrations are accompanied by our witness as to who Christ is and what he has accomplished for us through his life, death, and resurrection. My encouragement to you, church family, this day is don't waste this holiday season. I know many of you are like myself. The season can just fly by. So many places to be, so much shopping to do, so many things going on in our lives at church, outside of church, Christmas parties, that it's like a, a race just to get through the season, and before we know it, it's gone. Still others of you are like, oh, it's Christmas. I can't wait till it's over. Because of all the hubbub, all the trappings, all the commotion, it's more of a distraction than an aid to your spiritual walk with the Lord. And so you just want to run away from this time of year and hide away. My encouragement is for you as well. Don't waste this season. Use it to point people to the glory of our God as found and most clearly seen in the person of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Use it not only to celebrate what has taken place, but to point people to the fact that our King is coming again. And He's coming in God's full glory. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you that we have the reminder of this season 
as to what you have done for us, as to what you have accomplished, but also as a reminder to what is to come. And just as you promised to send a Savior into this world, you have promised that you are coming back again for us. You have promised to return as king and as judge, holding people accountable as to where they stand with you. Father, help us to look ahead this season. Help us to look ahead with excitement and joy, knowing that if you were faithful to that promise 2,000 years ago, you will be faithful to that promise to come again and return unto us. And Father, we look forward to that day. We look forward to the day when we can look upon you in your full glory and not be consumed by it. Because like you, we will be made perfect in that day. We will be able to stand in your presence. And Father, we look forward to that day so that we can worship you, our King. Bow down before you and extol you as our great and mighty Lord and Savior. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.